as who God is. Uh, it's one of the sweetest things that we can experience in this lifetime. And I, I look at it, as I say, I don't say as we get old, I say as we mature. Uh, we, we hear and we remember what the old saints, the matriarchs and patriarchs would say. And the things they would say would be so simple, uh, but it was so on point because they would say things, I know the Lord for myself. And it's I know the Lord, and I know that the Lord knows me. And so that's what we're going we gonna to be talking about tonight for our lesson. The importance of knowing God and realizing that God also knows us. That's, that's key. It's good to say we know him, but it's more important to understand and recognize that he knows us. And when God says he knows us in response, uh, that's the most wonderful thing that we can experience in this lifetime. And so that's what we're going to deal with tonight. And so as we get ready uh, to go into this lesson for tonight, I actually want to get their Bibles and, and get their pen, their paper, whatever they're going to use uh, to take notes on tonight. Uh, we know that God is an able God, that God performs everything that he said he's able to, to perform. He keeps every promise, he keeps every word, and he says this, he says, my word shall not return void, but shall accomplish what I sent it out to do. And that's the one other thing. When God sent it out, it's going to perform what he sent it out to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let's get your Bibles, and we're going to have three foundational scriptures for tonight, <clears throat> Old Testament scripture and two New Testament scriptures for our foundation tonight. Amen. And uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to open up. And the Old Testament scripture is going to be coming from the book of Job. And so if anybody knew anything about God, Job knew God. And God said he knew Job. And that's, that's, that's the connection and the bond we are the desire to have with God, amen? Mm -hmm. uh, to know that we know God, but then God responds and says, oh yes, I know my servant, Job. And so that's what we're gonna deal with tonight, amen? Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna look at Job chapter 42 <clears throat> and verses one through five is what we're gonna start with our Old Testament foundational scripture. Job chapter 42. And verses 1 through 5. Job chapter 42. And verses 1 through 5 is going to be our first scripture tonight. And so we're going to be turning pages tonight. Amen. Job chapter 42. verses 1 through 5 is going to be our first foundational scripture. Uh, that's going to be a part of our lesson tonight. Amen. Job chapter 42 <clears throat> and verses 1 through 5 reads as follows. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that had a counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. This is what he says. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Amen. Amen. And then uh, turn with us to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, 
Or Matthew chapter 7, pardon. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> And verse 21 and 22, 23. Matthew chapter 7. And verses 21 through 23. And this is the word of the Lord. Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye worker that work iniquity. Amen. And finally, uh, turn with us to the, the book or the epistle of Titus. Titus chapter 1, Titus 1, and we're going to read verses 15 and 16. Titus 1, and verses 15 and 16. Titus 1 and verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> Titus 1 and verses 15 and 16. And this is how those passages read. It says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God. But in words, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and to every work reprobate. Amen, amen, amen. So once again, this is what we want to Use for our lesson topic tonight. Be properly positioned for you to know God and have God know you. Be properly positioned for you to know God and to have God know you. Now, we're going to use the statement that Jesus used in Scripture when he was talking to the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees when they were asking him certain questions, and one of the parables, one of the things they asked him, they said, well, uh, who will this woman be the wife unto? If there was one brother that she was the wife unto, one brother, that brother died, and, and so the other brother married that wife, and then that brother died, and then the final brother married that wife. And they said, well, whose husband will she be? And Jesus used these words, he said, you do err in your interpretation of the scriptures. He told them there will be no one being taken in marriage or given in marriage in heaven. Uh, all those things are done with, and that's why we see this in glory. We are all children of God. We are all saints of God. There's no more wife, husband. At that point, we are all God's children. All those titles, all those designations are wiped away. But when we look at this, oftentimes people do err or they make the mistake of thinking that to know someone and to know about someone or to know of someone, that all of those things are similar. They think that all of those things are one and the same. They think, as the old people say, that they are akin to each other. However, it's important that we offer clarification that there is a difference between to know about, to know of, and to know. Those things are different. Now, a lot of times we may use that term and people say, well, yeah, I know him, but just because they say I know him or her doesn't mean they truly know them. Now, in the grammatical context, to know about means you have knowledge of a person or a subject 
or you know many things concerning this person or subject. A lot of times they'll be like this. A lot of times people will say, well, some people may know of the governor, but then other people who truly know the governor. Those of us who are citizens in the state of Louisiana, we know of him. We know about him. But his wife knows him. His children know him because they have been in close familiar relationship with him. To know of means this. It's used to indicate that you are acquainted with something or someone and know who or what they are, but do not have any other knowledge about them. And you hear somebody say, well, yeah, I know. Uh, he might say, well, some people may say, well, they know me or they know of me. Well, I know Young, I know him as a preacher, but I don't know him personally. And a lot of times people will say, well, I know of a person, and I've heard of a person, but they do not know them personally. Now, we talk about that term to know. This is what we're dealing with. In a grammatical perspective, to know means to be aware of through observation, through information, through interrogation, through investigation, and I love this one and because based on cross-examination, everything that's going on in the world right now, all these cases that we hear about going on in the news, especially with 45 and all these co-conspirators, this is what the people are trying to do. They have heard of them, they know of them, but nobody truly knows them except those who are close to them. And so the people that they're bringing are witnesses are not people that just know of them, but they've been in the, in the house, they've worked with them, and they know them personally. And so that's why he's trying to attack all those people who know him because he's not worried about those who know of him because he, he, he doesn't care about that. But to know him means you have information on him, you've observed him, you've interrogated him, and you've cross-examined them. And so the important thing for me with this when I saw that word cross-examination, that brings me to Jesus Christ. That brings Christ to us because Jesus was put on the cross. Jesus was examined. And so to look at that, he was cross-examined. They put him on the cross to see what would go on and notice and everything that happened while he was on the cross, Jesus passed the examination which demonstrated he was a lamb without blemish. He was innocent. He had done nothing wrong. He knew no sin, but yet he gave his life for us. Now, in the Hebrew context, in the biblical context, this is what no means. No means to perceive and to see. And, and is there several things here. It means to find out and to discern. It means to acknowledge. It means to have acquaintance with. It means to be assuredly aware of. It means to certainly comprehend. And that's why those, those old saints with that song, do you have good religion? Mm -hmm. Certainly, Lord. It means to be endued with. It means to be a familiar friend. What does the scripture say that about Jesus? He's a friend that stood closer than a brother. That means you're familiar with him. It means kinfolk. There we go with those, what those people used to say. It means kinsman. It means to be learned of. That's why Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He said, "Become get to the point where you know me. It means to have intimacy with. It means to be sure and have surety of. Now, in the Greek context, this is what no means. It means to turn the eyes to, the mind to, and the attention to. And what is written in Scripture? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your being. That means you get to know him personally, intimately. In the Greek, no also means this, to experience a state or condition. Same thing those old saints would say this. When they would be given a testimony or they would be given what they called a determination back in the day and they would talk about how the Lord had brought them out, how the Lord had fixed it for them. They would make this statement. They would say, I'm not telling you what somebody told me. I'm telling you what I know for myself. That's at that point that no... They've experienced him. They've been in a condition where they know who God is. God has laid his hands upon him. God's face has been on And so they will, they will boldly stand up and say, I know the man for myself. And they will tell us, if you don't know him, get to know him. And, and that's what they would say. A little simple statement. 
But you couldn't, you may not say, well, where was that in Scripture? They couldn't point it out in Scripture, but God had written it on the tablets of their heart. No also means this. To have regard or respect for someone. It means to cherish someone. It means to pay attention to someone. It is to properly see someone. This comes into play because when Job had gone through everything, had gone through all of his suffering, had lost all that he had, had to deal with the friends who accused him of doing something wrong. And after he went through all of those things, notice what Job said. He said, I've heard, I heard of you. He said, but now I see you for myself. In other words, he said, I heard about you. All my life I knew of you. But now I can tell people I truly know you. Because I've seen what you've done. I recognize what you've done and how you brought me through and what you brought me through. Now, being properly positioned to know God and have God know you. But well, let's share this, put it this way. It's not a Burger King have it your way or it's your thing, do what you want to do option. It don't, and, and, and I know they talked about Oprah and they talked about a lot of these talk show hosts and they talked about all these other people and they'll say, well, well, there's different ways to know God. There's different ways to get to God. Nope. God has set forth how you get to know him and how he gets to know you. This is set forth. We understand this. Based upon this information, God took the initiative and God established the position and protocol for our being able to know him and for him to know us. I'm going to say this again. God took the initiative and God established the position and protocol for our being able to know him and for him to know us. How do we know? You're going to use some Old Testament, New Testament scripture. When you look in the book of Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. This lets us know that God took the initiative. God established the position and protocol. In that scripture, this is what it says. This is what God says. And I will take you to be my people. Now, that's God personally speaking to the nation, of, to, the, to the children of Israel. He says, I will take you to be my people. He said, out of all the nations that were on the world, that are in the world, he chose them to be his people. Now, he says this, and I will be to you a God. But notice what he says, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so he said all of this for where the people would know. He said, I already know you because I've chosen you to be my people. But I need to get you at a place where you know me. And that means I want you to understand me for who I am, to recognize who I am. I'm not all of those gods that the Egyptians worship. I'm not those out of gods. I am the one true God. And I want you to know who I am. Then, in the New Testament, we know this scripture. He reveals that he set forth the protocol. He set forth the initiative for us to be able to be in a know him position and for him to know us. We've heard this scripture. John chapter 3 and verses 16 through 19. Most of the time we just quote John 16. But this is the full embodiment of having an understanding that God took the initiative. He established the position and protocol. In John chapter 3. Verses 16 through 19, this is what it says. For God so loved the world. Now, notice what it said. It didn't say man. It didn't say angels. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Which means he's the position and protocol. You can't get to know him, and he won't know you unless you go through his way and he set it up. You have to go through Jesus. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, and this is key, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Now we keep saying this, 
Man wants to look at this whole thing in a way that the judicial system of the world is set up. It's not the same. They say, well, I'm innocent until I'm proven guilty. God has already said in his judicial system, you are condemned and guilty until you're acquitted through Jesus Christ. So all the folks that are out there thinking, well, there's a, that everybody goes to heaven, it doesn't, don't fall for that, that, that false doctrine. And, and I, I prayed, and we prayed a couple of weeks ago for the young man who was out there preaching it. Uh, called him Pearson, he passed two days ago. And my prayer was this, that before his eyes closed, he rectified and he addressed that issue with God. To realize and say, Lord, yes, I know there's a heaven and there's a hell. Lord, forgive me. Because it says, even up to the point that you die, God is always ready to receive you to repent. Like the old people say, while the blood is running warm as your back, you have up until that last second before your eyes close and you leave here, you still can say, Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me for my sin. So that, that's our prayer, the hope that he made that declaration before he left his word. And then the scripture says this, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And so he set forth the protocol to tell us, you want to put yourself in a no-me position, and me no you position, this is what's required. If you don't go through Jesus, that's why Jesus said, I am the door. If you don't come through me, there's no other way to get to the Father. There's no other way to have that position to be in a place where you can say that you know God and God knows you. Now, this is the thing. There are people out there who believe, <laughs> like, like they used to say back in the day, that they can, they can pull the wool over God's eyes. Or they believe that they can jive God. Or they believe that they can fool God. But the Bible says they're fooling themselves and deceiving themselves. Understand this. God reveals his thoughts and his position regarding people who claim to know him, but in reality only know about him or know of him. They name dropping. That's what the people used to say. Well, yeah, 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 I, I, I know so-and-so, I know so-and-so. And then so-and-so, there, you, so -and -so, you know them? I don't know who that is. But they're name dropping, or like what the young people say today, they clout chasing, they're trying to get clout. And so they're using Christianity, and they're using the name of Jesus to try to get clout for themselves. But God is not pleased. This is what the word says about this. In our scripture, in Matthew chapter 7, Verse 21 to 23, and I'm reading the Amplified Bible version because it expanded upon King, what King James said. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus said this. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That goes back to what those old people used to say in that song, only what you do for Christ will last. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and driven out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And the scripture says this, and Jesus says this, and then I will say to them openly and publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. Put another way, this is what he's saying. The person who simply expresses the name of the Lord does not verify that they know God. But the person who sincerely emulates the nature of the Lord validates that they know God. So-called speaker of the house did something over the weekend, last couple of days, he went to his God's house to get his approval. <laughs> he went to his God's house to get his approval. But yet he says he's a Bible 
believe in man. But he went to that God that they set up to get his approval just so that he could get to know his God better and so that his God can get to know of him better. I just heard I say I didn't say no, I said no of. Because he's a no of kind of person. He, he know of you for the moment that it benefits him. But when things get trouble, I don't know. I, I don't know who that is. Notice this. There's one person who fits the position and criteria. One person who can say, but also did. And as you said in your prayer, he did it perfectly. One person. The perfect por portrait of a person who validated that they know God by the way they emulated the nature of the Lord is Jesus Christ. How do we know? Look in John chapter 5, verse 19. John chapter 5, verse 19. And once again, I'm doing Amplified Bible Word and it's expounding and expanding upon what Jesus said. John chapter 5 and verse 19. When they asked Jesus a question, and this is the answer that Jesus gave, it says, so Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you most solemnly, in other words, certainly I tell you, and Jesus said that many times, you hear Jesus say, surely, verily, verily, or certainly, that, that ties in to say that, I know why I'm here. <laughs> and I know what I'm talking about. This is what he said. Thank you, Lord. He said, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, the son is able to do nothing of himself of his own accord. But he is able to do only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way in his turn. Jesus said, what you hear me saying, I'm saying what I heard my Father say. What you see me doing, I'm doing what I saw my Father do. And so he was emulating everything. He, that's why he said he was the image. He came down to earth so that people could see God in the flesh, in action. So that they could see that God was reachable, that God was touchable, that God was near, that God was not so far away that they could not have any rationale or no reason or no communication with him. He came down so they can see. He said, this, he said my word is near. I'm near to you. He wanted them to see God walking on earth. And so they showed, or so he showed them how to be in a position where you know God and you can truthfully say you know God and that God says, I know you. And, and we know it, it happened that way because when Jesus was baptized, what did they say? He went into the Jordan and when he came up out of the water, the spirit came in the form of a dove and they heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said that several times mm -hmm. on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John went up there with him. And they said he was standing there speaking with Moses and Elijah. And he said they looked at it and they had been sleeping. They had dozed up. But when they woke up, they saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But they were in a transformed state, which meant the light of glory was all on them and all around them. Peter said, let's build three tabernacles. <laughs> One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. Now notice, it didn't say in Scripture that Jesus told Peter who they were. Peter had not seen Moses. Peter had not seen Elijah. But, here it is, thank you Holy Ghost, he knew them by name. Notice, he knew them by name. He didn't say, who are those two men up there Jesus talking with? He said, let me wait one tabernacle for Jesus, a tabernacle for Moses, a tabernacle for Elijah. And when he said those words, this is the voice they heard. 
This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And said when he, when he heard those words, Moses and Elijah were taken up and away, and the only one was left was Jesus. And so that's why he's saying, the one to focus on is Jesus, not Moses, not Elijah, all the prophets. He said, the one is Jesus. That's your positioning protocol. Now, when we look in Titus chapter 1, in verse 15 and 16, this is what it says. And we're just talking about how God, God reveals his thoughts and, 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 and he stands on everything. So when people start saying, I wonder what God thinks about it, go to the word. He already, he already gave the answer. You don't have to worry about trying to figure it out. The answer's right there in the book. He tells how he feels about all this that's going on with these politics and all this division, all of the lies, all of the manipulation, all the corruption. God explains how he feels about it. And the thing is, like we said before, the people who are how can you put this? That are wallowing the most in the mud. We're talking about the pigs. The people with the most mud and the dirtiest are the ones that keep hollering, I know the law. And so this is what Titus chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 says. He says, to the pure in heart and consciousness, all things are pure. But to the defiled and corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So for them, look at what they're doing. They don't have a problem with breaking the law. They don't have a problem with, 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 with arresting young children or locking up young children. They have no problem with killing people for their benefit. They have no problem with manipulating uh, the maps for their benefit. They have no problem with it because they're achieving their purpose, not God's purpose. Then he says this, their very minds and consciences are defiled and polluted. This is what Paul is saying that God has given Paul to say about those people. He says their very minds and consciousness are defiled and polluted. They profess to know God. They say that they recognize him, that they perceive him, and they say that they are acquainted with him. But they deny and disown and renounce him by what they do. So now this man going to go there and say, well, God sent me up to be speaker of the house. But he's going to go give praises to the man in, in Florida. <laughs> they're, all, they're all afraid of one man that has no power, but they're not afraid of God. Amazing. And, and that's, that's how you know when Satan has his hand in it. I always talk about this. When, when Paul was Saul and he was hunting down the Christians all over the country, they were afraid of him. Well, here comes Saul. When Saul came into the territory, Saul's coming. They're hiding and doing everything they can do. But then when the same people told the people, said, well, Saul is here. Ananias didn't even want to go and touch him. God said, he's my servant now. You go and touch his eyes so the scales will find, fall off his eyes. He did that. The minute they found out that Saul was working for God, we can get him now. We can kill him. They had to lower him out of the building in a basket to get him out of the country. Now, notice the difference. When he was the man chasing them of the world, they were afraid of him. When he became the servant of God, they wanted to get rid of him. And you see, that's how the world goes today. And they said there's places in, 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 in Texas today where churches have pretty much in place have banned the Bible. Because they say this about Jesus. They say Jesus is too woke and he's too weak. This is what they have said about the one that they know. So that, that, that tells you where we are. And then it says this in the scripture. They're unbelieving and disobedient and disloyal and rebellious. And it says this. They are unfit and worthless. Hear what it says. For good work, good deed, a good enterprise of any kind. And so they wonder why the things that they're doing, it fails. We can't, we can't get nothing to pass. We, nothing we want to do is go. It's unfit and worthless. It's not a good work of any kind. And so God is stopping it. Because God's approval is not in it. Everything that God has said, what did it say? 
Entertain, you never know. Entertain or treat the stranger well. You could be entertaining angels unawares. What do they say about the strangers? Get rid of them. We don't want them here. Get them out. They don't know God. Now, it's important to realize, and this is an important thing, just because they not to the point where they know him now doesn't mean they can't get to that point. And, and God shows grace. He, he shows grace to deliver. There are those who know of him, Nebuchadnezzar at the beginning, knew of God. But after he put him in the, in the wilderness, like a beast for seven years, and he came to his senses, he said, oh, no, no, I know you now. I uh, understand. When, when, when Elijah had to deal with Ahab and, and Jezebel's prophets, and they were talking about their God, and he started making fun of him. Maybe he's, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's going on vacation. Y'all not yelling loud enough. But the same situation, when he went through that, then those people said, surely his God is God. At that point, they didn't say no of him. They knew him at that point. And so that's the thing we have to realize, that a person can move from being someone who in essence knows about or knows of God to becoming someone who matures and being who through encounters and experiences becomes someone who knows God. That's what the old saints used to say. He said, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. And they'll say, I didn't, I didn't know God for myself. But now I've got to know him. And I know him for myself. And I want you to get acquainted. And I want you to know him for yourself. And so here we go again. So there's always, always opportunity. For a person to move from being in a know about and know of God to a person who says boldly, oh, I know him. I know him for myself. Now, how do we know this? We know this based upon the confession of Job. And we all talk about Job, how faithful Job was. He used to say he was a patient man. No, that, that was faithfulness that was keeping Job where he was. But Job, what did God say? He's my servant. He's a perfect and upright man. This is what God said about him. But God used him to defeat Satan. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And to move Job from a know about and a know of position to, yes, Lord, I know you now. All that was to get him. He, 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 he said, I know of you. And that's why he said he prayed. He knew his children were doing some things they shouldn't have been doing. So he said, he knew about, he said, well, if I pray for him and give sacrifices for him, maybe God will keep him. And that's why Satan took him. But notice, he did what he did it, needed to do to move him from a know about and a know of to I sure enough know you position. Know what Job said in the scripture. It talks about after Job had went through everything. In Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 5. After Job had did all this talking and said, if I can just get an audience with God, <laughs> I'll tell God everything I need to tell him. I asked God, why did I have to go through this? And when God came and said, gird up yourself, <laughs> we about to have a talk. And when God got through with all his who's and who that's about where were you and when, when were you, at that point, this is what Job answered after he had gone through all of those things. Job answered the Lord and said this. And notice what he started out with. He said, I know that you can do all things. Hear what he said. He said, I know that you can do all things and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained. That means once you, once you say it, it ain't, can't nobody stop it. Whatever you decide to do shall be done. He said, you said to me, who is this that darkens and obscures counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, he was asking Joe, you, 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 you talking about things you don't know. You may know about and know of, but you're not talking like that. There's a person who actually knows. You don't truly know me, but you're about to know me. And so then Job says this, Therefore, now I see I have rashly uttered that which I did not understand. So he's saying right there, he said, at that point, I knew of God, I knew about God, but I didn't really understand and know God until now. And then he says this, Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then he says this. Here, please.
please, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct and answer me. And then in verse 5, he says this. I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear. His faith was based on what other people had told him. His faith was based on what he had heard, read in the scroll about God and what had been taught to him. That's what he, his faith was based upon hearing. Well, they say, well, that's what faith comes by here. But at this point, he says, but now my spiritual eyes see you. He said, I knew of you as a physical person, but my spiritual man, I know you for myself now. And, and, and at that point, you saw how God started to deal with him different. And God even told his friends, you were talking about things that you didn't know about either. <laughs> you were talking about that you were saying things that you knew of me and about me, but you don't know, truly know me, truly know me. And so at that point, he said, you have to give a sacrifice, take it to my servant Job, and let him pray for you. And when he prays for you, then I'll repent of what I got a mind to do to you. And, and so it's like the thing, be careful when you start saying, oh, yeah, I know God. Be careful. And God will say, you're running your mouth, you're saying things that you don't know. But what does it say? If you don't know, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> or, or like, what was it, Teddy Pendergrass? Harvey, that's what was it? Harold Melvin in the blue note. If you don't know me by now, <laughs> you may never know me, but you're going to know me. <laughs> Now, what we need to do and what we're going to do is talk about what we need to do to be properly positioned to know God and have God know us. And the answer to that is contained in each letter of the word know. It's amazing, isn't it? In that each letter of the word know gives us insight and foresight and understanding of what we need to do to be properly positioned to know God and have God know us. First, we have the K. K means this. Keep yourself in kingdom kinsman position with God. I'm going to say it again. Keep yourself in kingdom kinsman position with God. Now we talked about Kisman last week. We talked about Kisman in the message. But this is what we're talking about. If you want to be properly positioned to know God and have God know you, be linked to God as a family member through blood relationship. That means you've got to be born again. You've got to be washed in the blood. You've got to become a child and disciple of Jesus Christ. It also means this, be someone who is a family member by rebirth. That's why Nicodemus came to the Lord. He said, you must be born again. He said, Lord, how can I go back in my mother's womb? He said, I'm not talking about that. You can't go back in your mother's womb. <laughs> he said, I'm talking about something that's spiritual, but you must be born again. But born again in Christ Jesus. Be someone who is a family member. Notice how this keeps saying a family member. It's all tied to family. A family member by marriage. And when we talk about marriage, it means covenant agreement with God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Everything that God talks about in this relationship with us, he says a marriage. In Revelation, he said, we are going to be a part of a marriage supper. Who? Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. That's a marriage. Covenant is an agreement. It's a vow. He says, so based upon that vow, that family vow, that allows us to be put in position to know God and for God to know us. Also this, be someone who is a kingdom inheritor and who has been gifted, graced, and granted kingdom rights. And, and I looked at this and I just said, thank you, Jesus. This is what those old saints would say all the time. Save my soul. Made me whole. And then they would say this, and now I have a right to treat the tree of life. All this, I've, I've inherited that right to the tree of life because God gifted it to me 
He graced it to me, and he granted it to me. I have kingdom right now. When you talk about God, it's not world, it's kingdom. Because God is in charge. Now, we look at this, and how do we know this? And based upon scripture. Write these scriptures down. In Luke chapter 12, in verses 31 to 30 and 32, we are given motivation and inspiration about this. And once again, this is the Amplified Bible version, so it expands on what King James says. Luke chapter 12, verse 31 and 32 says this. Hmm. But strive for and actively seek his kingdom, and these things shall be given to you as well. Basically, says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added unto you. He says, do not be afraid and anxious, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Notice, he didn't say for you to buy it, <laughs> put down a down payment on it, <laughs> get, a, get a, a line of credit so you can get in, because all this is done by God himself. Then we have John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. And we've heard this. And like I said, once again, I'm expanding upon the scripture we've heard. John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. Jesus says this. I am the good shepherd. And know what he says. And I know and recognize my own. And my own know and recognize me. Know what he says. He specifically says, I know them. And they know me. He said, even as truly as the Father knows me, and I also know the Father, and I am given my very own life and laying it down on behalf of the sheep, and I have other sheep beside these that are not of this fold, I must bring and impel those also. They will listen to my voice and heed my call, and so there will be and there will become one flock under one shepherd. So even though we have all these, these different locations and churches where people gather, this building not going to be there. None of the buildings, that doesn't matter the, the, the size or what, those buildings are not going to be there. The only people, the only buildings that's going to be there is that spirit that's within us. The spirit within us. Then, look at John chapter 15. In verses six, and, 6 through 8, and Jesus said this too. We're familiar with this. John chapter 15, verses 6 through 8, this is what Jesus said. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Judas Iscariot was a broken branch. He didn't, he didn't remain with Jesus. He, he betrayed him. Then he says this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. My Father is glorified and honored by this. When you bear much fruit, and prove yourselves to be my true disciples. True disciples know him, and he knows them back. So those who are out there talking about, I know Jesus, this, that, and the other. He always said, I'm, 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 they saying it openly? Ooh. He said, I'm going to say it openly when I get before my father. I don't know. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things I always remember my pastor would say. He said, when I, he said if you deny me, here, he said, I'm going to deny you before my, the angels of my father in heaven. And that's the one thing my pastor would say to me that I always stuck in my heart that brought me through. Mm -hmm. If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my father in glory. So if you say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know you. Jesus said, I don't know you either. Simple as that. Now, the other letter, the N, N means this. Never neglect to notice God, but have a need to be nurtured by God. I'll say it again. 
never neglect to notice God, but have a need to be nurtured by God. And here's some scriptures to give for support. You can write these down as well. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 18 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verses 18 through 20. And this is the word that God gave to Moses. And he told Moses to say to the people. And the Amplified Bible version again, he says, But you shall remember with profound respect, that word go respect, the Lord your God. And so those who keep saying that they're his, they're not respecting God. They're using his name in vain. And that's one of the commandments. Don't use his name in vain. For it is he who has given you the power to make wealth that you may confirm his covenant, which he swore solemnly and promised to your father. All these guys that I'm a self-made millionaire. Now you go, you, you in trouble. God don't know you. You don't know him. See, how can you make yourself? So you made yourself, birthed yourself, washed yourself, raised yourself, sold everything to yourself. That's what yourself made, right? You, you see, you didn't need nobody. I didn't need nobody. Well, you're selling stuff to other people, so you do need other people. So right there, that tells you that you deceive to say that you're a self-made man. Now, he says this, and it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them. He says, I testify against you today that you will most certainly, that goes that word again, perish. In other words, he said, no, you're going to perish. He said, like the nations which the Lord causes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not listen to and obey the voice of the Lord your God. We can go to, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't got to hear nothing from I won't hear it, Lord. I won't hear it. Good. You don't have to hear it. But see whose word is going to come to pass. His or ours. He says that all again. He says, go ahead and do what you want to do. But we're going to see whose word comes to pass. Then in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. He says this. And so God, God knows, children. So they're they trying to fool God. God knows. And this is what it says in that scripture. For even though they knew God as the creator. Understand, it says they knew God as the creator. They don't know God personally as their, as their father and savior. They did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasonings and silly speculations. In other words, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. They had their myths and their conspiracy theory about God and everything else, and none of it was true. And their foolish heart was darkened. And hear what he says. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Well, I'm the smartest man I know. I'm smarter than all the generals in the world. I'm smarter than everybody. I'm the only one who can fix this. God said, you just became a fool. Now, he says, and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God for an image that's of worthless idols in the shape of mortal man and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. This already happened at CPAC a couple years ago. And I looked at them and said, oh, Lord, this is bad. This is supposed to be a Christian conference with a bunch of Christians coming together. But they make an idol that's six foot tall or whatever it was, four foot tall, of their God and rolled him in there with a wand in his hair with a star and draped in shorts with a flag on. That's out of God. That's out of God. And so that, that's, that's what this says right here. They said that they knew God, their creator, but here they rolling in this person and this person is that God they're worshiping. God is not deceived. God is not mocked. Then in 1 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 2 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. This is what Peter writes. And Peter had gone through some things, so Peter knew of, but by this time, Peter knew him for himself. He says, like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk, that by it you may be nurtured and grow unto completed salvation. He says, since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, hear what it says, come to him. Then to that living stone which men tried and threw away. They, they, they tried Jesus, but they threw him away. They didn't want him. But which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come, and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house. For a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood. To offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. In other words, now that's why we can pray to God when we couldn't do it before. Those who are truly his and see a prayer, he receives their prayer. He knows their prayer, and they know that he receives their prayer. That's how that works. Then we have the O. O means to operate in obedience to and observance of the order, ordinances, and oration of God. This is what O means again. Operate in obedience to and observance of the order, the ordinances, and the oration of God. And this is how this is dealt with and demonstrated in Scripture. Now you say Old Testament, New Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 11 and 12, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 11 and 12. And I'm saying read the Amplified Bible version as well. He says this. Therefore, you shall keep, follow, and obey the commandment and the statutes and judgments and precepts which I am commanding you today. Then it shall come about because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them. Hear what it says that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast loving kindness which he swore to your father. And I'm going to love you in spite of you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's where that whole thing comes. No height, no death. None of those things can separate us from the love of God. That's the covenant he's given. When you know me, he lives, I love you forever. I love you forever. Then, in 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, and verse 3. 1 Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 3. It says this. But, if anyone loves God, with all feel reverence, obedience, and gratitude. Here's what it says. He is known by him as his very own. And is greatly loved. What does the scripture say? We are a chosen generation. A peculiar people. A raw priesthood. Chosen by God. And that's what that points to. Now it's important to understand this. And bring this down to. A, we we'll put a, a physical. Earthly. Perspective. A person. Can always love you. But that doesn't mean that that love is going to be returned. So just like this, it's like the mother and her children. Mama will love her children regardless. Children might say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm running, I'm leaving away, I'm going away. They may go away from that love, but that mother love never go away. Yes, ma'am. And my mom will say that even to the time she said, when I'm not here anymore, you always still know this, that your mama love you. That love never goes away. Never. We may, we may walk away from the love. And we may walk away from God. But it's not God who's walking away from us. Like you say, God is always where he always has been and always will be. God has moved. <laughs> we the one moved. Now, finally, we have the letter W. W means this. 
It means to wade, to walk, and work according to the word, the way, and the will of God. I'll say it again. Wade, walk, and work according to the word, the way, and the will of God. Now we heard that, that, that song, Wade in the Water. God's going to trouble the water. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about Wade. This is what Wade means, children. Wade means to press or push your way through according to the word, the way, and the will of God. That's what that means. Whenever you're wading in water, you're pushing yourself through the water. The water's pushing against you, but you're pushing yourself to keep moving forward. That's what Wade means. And so that's why Paul made this statement. In Philippians 3, 13 and 15, and we're familiar with it. And this is what he said. And this is the translated version, Amplified Bible. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it on my own yet. You hear what he said? Made it on my own yet. He said, I, I haven't captured that. But one thing I do, he said, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward or pressing forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the mark, the goal, to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God and Christ Jesus is calling us upward. So let those of us who are spiritually mature, see what he said, he didn't say those who are old, he said spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. So he's saying if, you, if you're confused about it, God will straighten it up for you. <laughs> He'll make it clear. You ask him, he will clarify it for you. And also we talk about walk means this. Walk means to move or to progress according to the word, the way, and the will of God. All of this is, is, is tied and linked to God. And this is what the Bible tells us about it, the important thing. God made it simple. In Old Testament scripture, scripture in Michael chapter 6, verse 8, and I love this scripture. Michael chapter 6, verse 8. Because people say, oh, it's just so hard. We've got too many things to do. It's too hard to try to be in that. Then God already said, no, the way to transgress is hard. The journey for a Christian is not hard. You may have come up with some challenges, but don't say it's hard. Because when you say it's hard, that means you're transgressing. That means you're going contrary to God. But this is what Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Uh huh. Do justly, love kindness and mercy. And hear what he said. And to humble yourself and walk humbly with your God. Know what he said? He's, so notice, if you're walking with somebody, that means they're walking with you. They right side, you know? He didn't say walk behind. He said walk with your God. That's what he told you not. Walk with me. And we're going to walk in the glory. That's why those old people say he walks with me. He talks with me. He guides me along the way. Then, the other thing, work. And work means this. It means to act, it means to do, it means to function according to the word, the way, and the will of God. I'll say it again. Work means to act, to do, and to function according to the word, the way, and the will of God. And here we go again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, is what Paul says. For it is not your own strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you. So for those who keep saying, I'm a self-made man, they're alive. To do that, that means God is not working in you. God has nothing to do with you. God is not, whatever you're doing, God is not doing. He says both to will and to work. That is strengthening, energizing, and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. 
So you decided in your mind, I'm determined to run on to see what the end is going to be. God give me the strength to do your will. That's why Jesus said what he said. He said, Lord, take this cup from it, but not my will. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And after he said that, that third time, you know what it said? The angels came and ministered him and strengthened him. He went back to his disciples and said, boys, let's go. Let's go. He didn't run from him. He went up to him and said, who are you looking for? At that point, he was focused the whole time. So as we conclude tonight, be properly positioned for you to know God and have God know you. That's the important thing. Well, yeah, I know God, but make sure God says, oh, yeah, I know him too. Because God had no problem saying that about his servants that he knew. He had no problem saying it about David. He had no problem telling it about Abraham. He had no problem when Moses' own brothers and sisters did say something against him by the way. He had no problem saying it to him, saying it to them. Moses, Moses is my friend. I talked to him face to face. Don't y'all say nothing about Moses. God has no problem saying that he knows you. And so when we say that these are the things, when we say no, keep yourself in kingdom kinsman position with God. Never neglect to notice God, but have a need to be nurtured by God. That's what David said, Lord, I need you. I can't do nothing else. Please don't take your spirit away from me. I need you. You're the air that I breathe. I need you. Oh, operate in obedience to and observance of the order, ordinances, and oration of God. Whatever God says, whatever God pins, whatever God directs, follow that, and you will not go wrong. Finally, the W, he said, wade, walk, and work according to the word of God. And once again, that means this. Press and push your way through according to the word, way, and will of God. Move and progress according to the word, way, and will of God. And finally, act. Do and function according to the word, way, and will of God. And when you do that, that demonstrates that you know God and that God knows you. And other people will see that God knows you. Because when Peter and the disciples were going up before the people and they were beating them, say, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they started speaking. They said, these are unlearned men. He said, but, oh, but they've been with Jesus. They act like him. They do like him. They talk like him. And that was what the other people saw. With Joseph, Potiphar, and Pharaoh, they knew his God is with them. They knew they said, this young man's God is with him. Daniel, their God is with them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we know our God. We're not bowing down to your idol, idol God. Their God knows them. So when you know God for yourself, and then God knows you, if it had not been for the Lord was on our side, where would we be? Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for showing us. Thank you, Father God, for always opening up your word to give us fresh revelation of knowledge and insight and foresight. And, Father, continue to be with you, these, your children, your prayer warriors who have gathered here tonight. Be with those here in person, those who are online. And, Father God, just continue to bless, continue to gift, continue to grace, and continue to grant us, Father God, your wisdom of on high so that we can fulfill your work and be all you would have us to be. To your glory, your honor, and your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank God. All right. Be like the old folks. They, they had no problem. I know him from a and look. I just look at them, you know, older lady. I know him for myself. So God bless you tonight, amen. May God bless you with the I am that I am as you go forth on this journey with him, and we'll see you next time.